different ages and places can come together tonight united in a simple cause to take care of the place that you've given us to be stewards over. So help us tonight in the words that we say, in the questions we ask, in the answers that are given, the comments that are made, in all the discussion that takes place. Help us to gather a greater understanding of what we need to do as citizens and as government to prevent these catastrophic things from happening to that which you have so lovingly given to us in the creation of your earth. Bless our gathering together tonight. Help us to be comfortable even though we're crammed in here sitting on one another's laps. For truly, God, we are here for that purpose, to understand and know your love and grace for each one of us and what we've been called to do to take care of this earth that you've given to us. We ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. That's the four things. I'm done. Thank you, Pastor John, and thank you for allowing us to come here tonight. We and present the information that we need to get out to you guys. So, I want to welcome everyone. Um, our agenda was up on the thing here just a second ago. There you go. And I want to take just a second to introduce myself. My name is Karen Nickel. I am one of the Just Moms STL um, members. This is Dawn Chapman. She is the other one. And you will hear from both of us throughout the evening as well as some other speakers that will talk a little bit later. So, right now I would like to recognize any elected officials that we have with us tonight. If you would just stand, please. Jill Shoup, State Senator. Bill Otto, State Rep. Amy Pelker, Councilwoman St. Anne. Margo McNeil. We have representatives from uh, Lacey Clay's office, Congressman Lacey Clay's office here, Sean, and we also have John with Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal here. We also have Paul from St. Louis County here, and I don't know your last name. Bill Osterline of Pattonville Fire District, I believe, is here. Of course, our Pattonville Fire District, our fire guys up here, Matt Levanchi, Jim Ustry, representative from SSM Health here, um, and we also have our Franciscan Sisters of Mary here who support us today. So real quick, I'm going to go through some updates that you guys might want to know about. Um, on October 21st, Dawn and I will do a presentation at Wellspring Church in Ferguson. It's open to the public. You can come and listen. If there's something here that you missed or you want to find more information, you can come there and we'll be there. There is a CAG meeting on October 26th. That is the Community Advisory Group, which is sanctioned kind of by the EPA. You can get in front of the EPA. They will be here. I don't know. Not here. Operating Engineers. No. Up there. Okay. They'll be at the Machinist Hall. Um, our, no, our next meeting is November 19th, and we are asking everyone to please bring canned food for the church here. We're having a canned food drive. I've just been informed that uh, Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal is here in the back. On October 23rd, the Missouri Coalition for the Environment 
will have their um, grassroots gala. It's a wonderful event. I would encourage everyone to try to make that. Um, we do have Ed Smith here with the Coalition for the Environment. They stand with the moms and work with us on everything. They presented the moms the Richard Pryor Activist of the Year Award in 2013, so we were really proud of that. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Now, November 12th, Pat Millen Parkway Democratic Club will have a panel discussion, another place you can go to find more information. There are also two films that are coming out. One has already been out, and some of you have seen it. It's The Safe Side of the Fence. It stars Denise Brock, if you all are aware who, who Denise Brock is. It will be showing on November 11th, and we will have more detail uh, after the meeting for that. November 15th, The First Secret City by Allison Carrick and C.D. Stelter. They followed uh, Dawn and I and the rest of the Westlake group for a couple of years, and they have finally got to the point where they're ready to release their film. It's going to also be another wonderful film. You should try to get out and see. It's on November 15th. I believe tickets went on sale today. I don't know all the information for that, but we'll get it for you. There is a donation bucket out in the hall. We have, we take up donations because we spend a lot of money in printing and all the things that we need to do um, to get this information out to you guys. And I don't know if you know or not, but Dawn and I and Megan Beckerman went to Washington, D.C. back in May and we tried to get in front of Gina McCarthy, the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator. So we have this money that we've been collecting it's there for if we need to take a bus trip to Jefferson City or wherever we need to go so we have some resources there to help us out. If you want to order a shirt, like this. Okay. Um, Megan was taking orders in the front. They are, we need for you to prepay for them and you can place your order with her. We want a special thanks to Megan Beckerman who's running the table out there, Debbie Disser who's doing the video up there, Tanya and Mike Mason who printed things for us and put the sign out there. Um, Kristen Camuso and all of our other volunteers that help pull this stuff together. And most importantly, we don't often say this, but I know Don will agree with me, we want to thank our husbands. Because without them, we couldn't do any of this. He stays home with them. He is not here tonight. He takes care of the children. He does an amazing job with that. Luckily for me, my kids are older. Um, I have a 13-year-old, she's the youngest, but my husband is amazing and helps and supports me in every way he can. So I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. <laughs> so you guys might have seen that we've been collecting signatures for a petition to the governor to call a state of emergency. We are going to be delivering those petitions on October 28th. We will deliver them to the governor's office in St. Louis here. And then we, are, we set it up for 10 a.m. Anybody that wants to go with us, there's a sign-in sheet out there. You can sign up to go. We'll get you more information as it comes closer. There are also other sign-ups out there that you can sign up for. There's a sheet for protesting and rallies. There's a sheet for passing out flyers. And then there's a sheet for... Um, oh, petition delivery. So those three things are out there. Come up with anything else. Pass it by us and we'll, we'll put a sign up for that too. Some of you that came in late, if you didn't get a chance to sign in, if you would please sign in and put your email address on there or some way that we can get information to you, that would be great. Last but not least, um, I want everyone in this room to remember that Dawn and I are just moms. We don't get paid for this. We're not involved in any litigation. We do this to protect our family and yours. So, with that being said, I would expect for everyone in this room to be respectful and thoughtful. We did not make this mess. We are only the messengers. We live this 24-7 just like you guys do. We're scared, we're frustrate, frustrated, and we're angry. And so whatever you guys can do as a community and pull together and stand with us will make us much stronger and we will unite and we will solve this problem. We are going to have question and answers at the end. I would ask that you get let us get through the presentation. It's going to take a few minutes. There's a lot of information that we need to cover. 
We will, at the end, have you come up. You can ask your questions. I think we also passed out some cards. Maybe you could write your questions down, and we could have those answered up here for you. So we will get it started with Dawn. She's going to give you a report on the Attorney General's report that came out. We'll post the video later. Sorry. Speaker in the outside. You've got a lot. Do you know what the link to it is? Ask STL Dagger so someone could tweet that out, STL Dagger, or put it on the Facebook page real quick and let people know that this gentleman, thank you so much for doing that, is live streaming it right now. They can get on that and watch it. Um, I want to make sure you guys understand. First of all, I know. When we say community, we mean St. Charles, O'Fallon, all of North County. I want you to know that. You might, you know, we might hear us talk about North County and whatnot. We want to welcome all of you. How many people, I know this is silly, is this your first meeting? I need to know this so I know how slow we go. Oh, gosh. Awesome. Awesome. We've been doing these meetings once a month for two years. So what we've tried to do in this presentation is give you guys kind of two years worth of information and cram it in and make it as, as understandable as possible. Um, it's going to be kind of tough, so I want to start out with this. The landfill that is on fire is right, it's right over that way, right over that way, about less than a, sorry, wrong way, over that way, about less than a mile from here. I want you guys to know, this is not an ordinary landfill, this is a super fun site. Superfund sites are under the jurisdiction of the EPA by themselves. So without a fire, Superfund sites are labeled as some of the most dangerous sites in the nation. They're labeled that by the EPA and the federal government. So when you hear that this site is on fire, remember that this site was risky and dangerous before it caught on fire, okay? You're going to hear people say, well, landfills catch on fire. That's true, but this is no ordinary landfill. In St. Louis, we have lots of industry. This was an unregulated landfill. It was an old quarry that was blasted out. I'm going to show you some great photos so you understand. Everyone was allowed to dump at this landfill. This was a Tony Soprano landfill. You could put anything you wanted in it. It was not regulated, okay? So what's on fire now, what you're smelling when you smell the emissions are chemicals and other things. There is municipal waste to mix in with it, but it has some of the worst of the worst. It was designated a Superfund site because of those chemicals. Okay, so now I'm going to take it a step further. You have a Superfund site that is a landfill in a quarry with chemicals on fire. On the other side of that site, directly connected, you have the world's oldest nuclear weapons waste from the Manhattan Project. Okay? I don't know, can you guys raise your hand? Did anybody know we processed uranium? It's gonna help me in a second. Okay, a lot of you knew that. Some of you didn't. We, St. Louis, processed the first uranium ever right here in our city. It was brought over from Africa, from the Belgian Congo. It is very rare, it's uranium-235. It was extremely potent and pure. We processed it and then the leftover waste from the processing was left out in places all over North County, okay? And it eventually, here's a site. Here's a picture of the airport site with barrels and mountains of radioactive waste. There was enough radioactive waste to fill Bush Stadium. There was a lot. And it was all transferred and trucked all over North County. Some of you have heard of Coldwater Creek. That is how Coldwater Creek got contaminated. We'll get into that in a second. So that is what's going on at this landfill. Many of you probably heard for the first time about this situation because letters came home from the schools. Letters came, you know, the news has been covering an evacuation plan. I want you guys to know, and so do your first responders and everybody, that this situation has always been very serious, okay? That is why Karen and I have dedicated almost three years to this situation. It's always been serious. It's more serious now that the fire has moved, but it was serious before. Okay, so for those of you that just found out, I'm very sorry you're finding out like this. We truly have done everything we can as moms 
to reach out to you and get you this information. And somebody failed you, and I don't know who that is, but somebody owes you an apology if you're just now finding out about this. I want to move on to the Attorney General's report real quick. Attorney General filed a lawsuit in 2013, a couple months after I learned about it and I started getting involved. Karen was already involved then. Here are his findings. Everything that you're going to see, this is not our wording. We have a link up so that you can actually get online and read it for yourself. AG Coster's expert reports found radioactive contamination and tree coring sampling off-site around the landfill. So the radiation that is sitting in two areas that we know of and mixed in with the landfill, they test it off the site and they're finding it off-site. The VOCs, including benzene and high concentrations in the groundwater wells outside the perimeter of the landfill. What's happening at this site with this fire is producing a lot of hazardous liquid called leachate. You're going to hear that a lot. It's important that you know that term. And what's happening is it's mixing with the groundwater on site, and because it's a quarry, it's limestone. It's porous, it's like Swiss cheese, and the water goes in and out of it. The smoldering fire has moved beyond the gas interceptor wells in the neck of the landfill. I've got a great diagram from the Attorney General. These are all diagrams from the Attorney General's office in DNR and other agencies. These are not our diagrams to show you what this means. Republic was negligent in aggressively over-extracting the gas system well outside industry best practices. Back in 2010 and a little before that, methane was seeping off the site, and what they did is they took these wells and they turned them up. Turned them up higher than industry, landfill industry recommends. And when they tried to suck and pull that methane back on, they pulled oxygen in. That's how this landfill fire started. Business decisions were a factor in the cause of the fire that was foreseeable and preventable. And that's very important because that's part of the litigation that the AG is saying. This, this is a quote from the Attorney General. It could have been prevented. Next. Comments on the reports. These reports underscore what's been clear from the beginning. Republic Services does not have this site under control. That's very important because you'll hear from another side, well, you know, it's under control. No, it's not. This is a very serious situation. Not only does the landfill emit a foul odor, it, it appears that it has poisoned its neighbor's groundwater and vegetation, and it says the people of Missouri can't afford to wait any longer. Republic needs to, to get this site cleaned up. Okay? That was a recommendation made months ago. So now we're here today. Several months have passed. Next. Nice. I want to show you this diagram, and I really hope my pointer works. Remember I told you that we processed some of the most rare uranium on this earth. We went to Africa to get it. That's it right there. You don't have to remember it, uranium-235. Here are the photos of where the radiation is up here and up here. Any place on this side, if you just happen to pass by it, any place you see trees, that is where the radioactive waste is. That's how you know if you're just passing by the site. You can see the little signs, the little radioactive waste symbols along the fence. The Rock Road, sorry, she asked where the Rock Road was. This is St. Charles Rock Road. This is the actual entrance. This is the entrance to the landfill. Here's the trees in this area where the radioactive waste is. And here's another section over here that's radioactive. Do it on this map, sorry guys. Hussman, 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 right there, okay, next. We can go back to these maps if someone wants to see them again during question and answer. Um, the fire could reach the radioactive waste in as little as three to six months. This is directly from the report from the Attorney General's office. Um, Landfill Fire Consultants Incorporated has determined that if the smoldering event were to extend in the North Quarry at the same rate as was observed in the South Quarry, the reaction could reach the radioactive waste in as little as three to six months. Okay, I'm going to get into where the fire is now, and I'm going to explain a little bit more what this means. Okay, the bottom line, because I know a lot of you are scared, is that this can be stopped and prevented. Okay, it does not have to be allowed to hit that waste. 
This report has been, it's been written since July, but this just came out. What's the date on this report? September 3rd. So, you know, we're into October now, obviously. Next. Hydrogen gas. What we're showing you on this report, many of you know about the evacuation plan and the shelter in place. Many of you got letters home from your school districts. It's important for you to understand that things can happen at this landfill that would require that plan to be put in place that don't require the fire to hit the waste. Does that make sense? There are a lot of risks at this site that, again, would require an emergency response to this landfill besides letting the fire hit the radioactive waste. And that is obviously a worst case scenario. One of them is this. There are tremendous amounts of hydrogen ballooning on the site. If you're on the Facebook site, if you're not, I recommend getting on West Lake Landfill. You're going to see pictures posted, usually by Robin Daly and other people who go up. They live next to the landfill. They're constantly taking pictures of it because things change at the site. Things look different every day. You'll notice that she'll take photos of giant, it looks like a bounce house, looks like giant air pockets building up under the plastic liner. This is what's billowing underneath it, and it's important to know that it is flammable. Highly flammable gas, many will recollect the, ex the explosion of the Hindenburg dirigible as a graphic reminder of the danger posed by hydrogen gas and bubbles. And this is important. Landfill Fire Consultants Incorporated believes that an emergency plan needs to be developed concerning safe work push procedures around these bubbles if one does not exist currently. Okay, next. Yes, the odor is dangerous. If you encounter it, it is recommended by the Department of Health and Senior Services, so not by Dawn, not by Karen, but by your state health department that you stay out of the odor. Sensitive individuals could suffer breathing difficulties, bloody noses, headaches, the list goes on and on. We're going to give you a link to where you can get on that website and look at all that information and look at their recommendations, okay? But it's important, and it was a shock to us, that it was written in the Attorney General's lawsuit. This record, the record indicates that a number of individuals with chemical sensitivities were seriously affected. Again, HIPAA privacy, we don't know who those are, we're not asking, but apparently the Attorney General does and so does the state of Missouri. Okay, next. It is very important that you understand that we have bipartisan support for this issue. Five letters have been written and signed by all four. When is the last time you've known them to come together and agree on the seriousness of an issue? But yet they have on this. And that's incredible. How ever. However. It's one thing to write it on paper and to make recommendations. It's another thing to pass legislation and really become proactive in this situation. And that is what we need your help for. We need you guys to help us put a tremendous amount of pressure on them to fix this. Next. I think we already have this photo. These are pictures of radioactive waste. We won't get into it, but basically... The radioactive waste was taken from this site, the site that you see, and it was illegally dumped at Westlake Landfill. Next. Here is a top-down photo of the landfill. Here's where we're going to get into kind of the nitty-gritty of what the landfill is and what's happening at the site. If I need to focus this way, somebody just point, because I'm like turning like this. And this is like my natural side, so. You have an area up here that has radioactivity. You also have an area over here that has radioactivity, but right now we're focusing on this one. This is the one that is directly affected by the fire, okay? This whole bottom area down here is engulfed. This is what we call the South Quarry. The whole thing is on fire. It's about the size, Matt, about the size of, sorry, this one too. Over here, the whole bottom half of this landfill is on fire. It's about the size of, I think, six football fields. It's 350 feet deep. 250 feet deep in this area. It's deep and it's wide. It's a big, smoldering event. Here is the neck area. 
You guys are going to hear us talk about that. Remember we said the fire, the Attorney General's report just said the fire moved past the neck. This is the area that he's talking about. Okay? And then this whole area up here is what we call the North Quarry. Okay? This is the North Quarry. And then up here is where the radioactive waste is. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, we'll get into that. Okay, here is a really great, by the way, this is from the Department of Natural Resources. It's a great map. You can see we've added flames in. They didn't put these pretty flames in, we did, <laughs> to give you an idea. I know. Um, this whole area down here and down here. Oh, I don't want to get you in the eyeball, mister, with the laser pointer. <laughs> um, down here is where the fire is. Here is the neck area, okay? So you can see it looks like a neck. It's a very kind of small, narrow area. It's still very deep. And then you can see the top part of the quarry. What I want you to notice, look at the purple areas. All the purple areas are where the radiation is sitting. You'll see this little wedge. You see the yellow wedge? So what happened is, this is one of many EPA mistakes at the site. EPA thought they knew where all the radioactivity was at the site. And then upon further investigation, specifically because of the fire, in an effort to see if they could put in a barrier, they did additional testing and they, they're finding radioactivity outside of that spot. Okay, so this was another area. We'll get into that in a minute. There's a better map next. Okay. Ed Smith from the Coalition for the Environment did this slide. It's a really great example. All the area shaded is radioactive, okay? Here's the fire. Fire's down there circled in purple. And then there's the neck area. Okay, next. Okay, here is a diagram looking down on top of the site. Another example. What I want you to pay attention to, look at the purple area first, okay? The purple area is where when we started this, maybe th almost three years ago, Karen and I, this is where they told us that the radiation was. It was limited to that area in the North Quarry, okay, right on top of it. The orange line is actually old. That is a new area of radiation, so now they circled it in orange. You can see that up there? I'm going to show you the next map. Okay. You can kind of see, can you see the outline of the orange? You see it right there? This green area right here, what's really important about this, a lot of you guys have heard talk of a barrier, okay? The Attorney General, when he filed suit against Republic Services, ordered them to put a fire break in, said that they were not ever allowed to let this fire hit the radioactive waste, okay? And the agreement was that they would build a barrier right here. Now, I don't know. Debbie, did you put the Thalhammer slide up? No. Sorry. No. What's really important to point out, what I want you guys to understand, is that, and Matt can talk about this a little bit later, but in 2013, when we first found out about this, the fire expert, one of the fire experts that's mentioned in the Attorney General's report, Todd Thalhammer, recommended that in this neck area here, sorry, I'm trying not to hit you. In the neck area here, the barrier would be built there. He said that is a narrow area, and it's a logical place to put in some sort of fire trench. And that was never allowed to happen. It's not allowed to happen because the company refused to do it, but partially because the state of Missouri didn't push hard enough. Okay? They didn't push hard enough, and now what we have is we have a fire that's in front of it. So... When the fire progressed through the net and was pushing, it was too late to build the barrier there, so they tried to build it here. What I want to point out to you, you can see, see how the orange line comes in through it? You see that on here? They're finding radiation in the area that they wanted to build the barrier. So no, there is no barrier at this site. And the reason is because they can't find a spot that doesn't have radiation in it to put one in. Okay? That's the problem. So there's a lot of misconceptions. Is there or is there not a barrier? No. There is no barrier at this site. Next. 
This is one of my favorite maps. One of my favorite maps. This is a really cool sideways version of the landfill. Okay, it's on its side. It almost, for Star Trek fans, kind of looks like the Starship Enterprise a little bit. Um, what I want you to see is this is the area down here. That's the area that's on fire, okay? Big area down there. Here's the neck area. You see? Republic Services for a very long time, and they may still be saying it, is saying that there is a natural stone. They're saying that there's two separate quarries and that they're not connected. That's not the case. You can see it on this. It's not the case, not true. There is some soil put in this area, and there is also a road, but there is no barrier to stop it. What I want you to see, too, is to step up. This is the North Quarry, okay? And then up in this area is where the radiation is. The radiation is now being found, what we call the toe, the toe of the North Quarry, right on the very edge where it starts to get deep. And then um, we're waiting patiently on EPA to tell us what their latest findings are. So this whole area up here. Now you can see why they wanted to put a break in here because it was more shallow. It would have been easier. It's in the end cheaper. Let's just call it that. It would have been cheaper. I'm sorry, what? Oh, the distance. I have a map to show you. I mean, the distance from the fire to the radioactive waste. Okay. From the orange. Okay. Go back to the orange one. Okay. So the distance between this and this down here was about 1,200 feet. We were told from the very beginning from this fire that the fire was about 1,200 feet from the radioactive waste. We do, we, meaning nobody has come out and really put a number out there now that we know. Obviously, you guys can see and you know they're finding radiation in other areas. What we don't know is what is the distance between this to here. You guys can Google map it and Google Earth it. Um, it looks like anywhere from like 800 to 1,000, but that's us. That's just civilians using a ruler. But the problem is, is that even if we knew to this line, they're still finding radiation outside of this line. So we still do not have any idea, no idea whatsoever, if there's radiation here or not. And that's the million dollar question, folks. The fire's in this area. Is there radiation in this area? Is there radiation in this area? And we don't know. We don't. And I hate to tell you guys that, but it's the truth. Next. This is one of the reasons why we are pushing the governor to declare some sort of state of emergency or just speak out and make a comment. We need a comment on the seriousness. You've got the attorney general going on the record. We were vocal. We're up here doing these meetings. We need somebody high up to call this site what it is and to get somebody in here to fix it because today we still don't have a solution and it's been, as this lady pointed out, a month since, since this report came out. So you'll see this online. We're asking that you sign it because we want to get a group together and present it to them. You know, I guess you could call this asking nicely. We're asking him very nicely to step in and do something but I'm sure you guys are feeling a little bit like I am and frustrated and thinking nice might not be good enough right now. He needs to come in and make a statement on this. The other night, if you guys were watching the news and they asked the governor's office for a comment, he said no comment. And to me, that is a statement. That is a statement in its own. Next. That'd be next. Okay. I'm gonna pass. This over to Ed Smith from the Coalition for the Environment. A lot of you have asked us what happens when a fire hits radioactive waste. Um, there are other sites that have had this occur, not like ours, but I'm gonna let him do a brief presentation on that and kind of explain to you some of the research behind it. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I did put up a map of the Westlake landfill versus where we are where we are now, just so everybody has some perspective. Um, and so we can we can go to the next one. I just wanted to give give some folks some perspective on where we're at. So this is a fire that occurred at the on the southern tip of the South Quarry. Uh, I believe it was February 2013. 
and um, you can see that there's a smoke plume coming out of the South Quarry. Unfortunately, on, on this day, it was a Saturday or Sunday, it was on the weekend, uh, the local residents around the landfill had to call the fire department because the landfill company did not. They thought they could manage it themselves. Um, so, you know, take that for what you will. Next. This is another picture of the smoke plume. This is uh, uh, the smoke heading basically south, uh, south-southeast towards the industrial areas of, of Earth City and Bridgeton and towards Spanish Village and towards the interchange of Highway 70 and 270. Next. So what my organization did is we decided to take a look at some uh, scientific reports of fires impacting radioactive materials uh, in in nature, uh, things that have actually happened in the wild, or un un one of these is controlled, one of these is not controlled. Um, so what I'm going to walk you through are two Chernobyl fires. Um, these are not fires that were related to the meltdown of the nuclear reactor. We're not talking about thousands and thousands of degrees. Uh, we're talking about radioactive contamination that moved off site due to Chernobyl. There's a lot of forests around Chernobyl in Ukraine. And just like here out west, when it gets dry, those, those forests catch on fire. And so this first study is the transport of radioactive materials by, wild, by wildland fires in the Chernobyl accident zone. Um, this region constitutes the largest area in the world with the highest contamination by radionuclides and is located in a fire-prone forest environment in the center of Europe. The analysis of forest fire smoke have shown that the content of radionuclides in smoke exceed the permissible rate for inhabited areas several times. Ash and not fully burnt materials remained after forest fires, excuse me, remained after forest fires or open sources of the ionizing radiation. By the contamination level, they correspond very often with radioactive waste. Basically what we're saying here is that there was a forest fire it mobilized these radionuclides via smoke, and it also left them concentrated behind in the ash after the, the fire was finished. Next. This is, this is, that was a non-controlled uh, study. This is a controlled study. This is the uh, resuspension and redistribution of radionuclides during grassland and forest fires in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Uh, and in the previous one, we were looking at cesium-137. That has a lighter atomic weight than plutonium, and so uh, it, it, it has the ability to, to move farther if, if mobilized. But plutonium has a similar atomic weight to the radium, the thorium, and the uranium that is found at the Westlake landfill. So we found this to be particularly insightful. Uh, it says the heavier, the heavier fractions of the radioactive aerosol are released at lower height and have higher deep deposition velocities. Therefore, they are mainly deposited closer to the plot. It doesn't say that they stayed in the plot. It means that they were moved, but they just didn't go as far as some of these other lighter uh, atomic materials like the cesium-137. So, um, again, this is all due to surface fires. This is not a smoldering forest fire. This is, uh, this is a, an actual fire. Uh, this is what we would expect a worst case scenario to look like at the Westlake landfill. Um, and then this is our, our commentary on it, is that the experiment notably tests plutonium under these conditions, which is heavier than cesium and more similar in weight to the thorium radium at the Westlake landfill. Plutonium deposition density in forest fires was determined to be smaller than deposition densities of the lighter elements, strontium and cesium, by two orders of magnitude. However, the plutonium was still transported a significant distance from the, distance from the initial plot. And then we have the, the charts. This is a document that my organization is continuing to work on. We're sharing this with you tonight because you've seen a lot of information, possibly if you're paying attention to what Republic Services says, or in certain cases, the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA so far hasn't done a worst case scenario assessment though, so I will say that. Um, but this is what a worst case scenario could possibly look like at the Westlake landfill. Questions afterwards? Uh, I, next. 
these are the uh, citations for those reports that we looked at. Uh, this will be available online in the near future. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew where we were getting our information from. We're not making this stuff up. Um, next, I believe there's one more picture. Yeah, there's one more picture of the smoke coming out of the south quarry of the, the Westlake landfill. Um, and just to give you guys an idea, there was even a letter today in the Post-Dispatch uh, from, uh, from a professor saying that what I just showed you that happened in real life, that was studied, couldn't happen at Westlake Landfill. Uh, that's taking a very narrow view. Uh, this is something that Republic Services did in response to an EPA request for what happens if the fire hits the radioactive waste. They said that at an atomic level, the, the radioactivity wouldn't change, that it wouldn't vaporize. Well, that's not, that's not the real world scenario here. We're talking about atomic level radionuclides attaching to smoke and mobilizing and moving off site. Uh, and, and that is what a worst case scenario looks like. And the only way that we prevent that is, in our opinion, at the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, is to remove the radioactive material from any risk of fire. Thank you. What I want to do real quick, I want to keep this picture up. Um, Representative Otto was out there the morning that this occurred too. It's very important to understand. You can kind of see, can you see stuff kind of falling there? See it falling? This left a trail of soot on the snow. I mean, there were definitely particles in this. And it got up and went. And it wasn't all that windy that day. It wasn't very windy at all. In fact, it was cold. But... You know, we don't say this to scare you, we just want you to understand again, that is the worst case scenario at this site, and hopefully that's why you're here, is to help us prevent that from happening. I want to go back, since Ed mentioned removal of the waste. Debbie, can you put up our screen with our goals real quick? I want you to understand that we have several platform things that we want you guys to know about that we would like to see happen at this site. One of them is the voluntary buyout within a mile of this site of people living in, is it not up there, Debbie? I'm looking, hang on. <laughs> huh? oh, Rob, I'm standing in front of them. Look at that. There it goes. Immediate permanent relocation for homeowners and renting families that want to move that are located within one mile of the Westlake Landfill fence line, paid for by the landfill owner, Republic Services. Nothing that happens at this landfill will will not affect them. Yep, and the fire is supposed to burn, according to Republic, for a minimum of five more years. Remember that. And that's what Republic says. Provide fair market value assurance for homeowners living within five miles of the Westlake landfill for five years or until the fire is out, whichever is longer, paid for by the landfill owner, Republic. We don't want this to destroy our community. We don't want it to destroy our community. We don't want it to lower the tax base. This is, it's, it's causing businesses to leave. The third, authorize the Army Corps of Engineers FUSRAP, formally utilized Sites Remedial Action Program, just call it FUSRAP, to take charge of the cleanup. They are the most qualified government agency to provide a safe, permanent solution for the radioactive wastes offer and that offers better protection for workers and um, we're also asking for the possibility of a health care program for health care assistance for the public the safe and permanent solution to radioactive waste means it can never again come into contact with a fire or any other natural or man-made disaster so some of to some of you that is removal we're not scientists but if it can be, it needs to be. But what can never be allowed to happen is the two to meet. Okay? I hope you guys understand that one. Next. Be Bill. Think we're on to Bill Otto. Bill. I'm going to introduce State Representative Bill Otto. You're sitting in his district right now. He'll tell you that. That's why he's up here speaking. We don't make it a habit of letting politicians get up and speak. This is a community meeting. <laughs> sure. Keep it short. Keep it short or I'll take it away.
thing I want you guys to understand is that the folks that are up here, these folks are here because they are concerned about the community, but I'm telling you, they don't get paid. They sell t-shirts and pass a hat to pay their expenses. These moms and, and all of the groups that are here tonight, they, and someday we're gonna, we're gonna put statues of them around here. <laughs> I was, asking to, I was asked to speak here to talk about a state response, okay? You have to understand that there are two separate and distinct issues on, at this landfill. First, there is a radioactive waste that is under control of the Superfund site and has, can only be dealt with by the EPA. They're the only ones that can remediate this, this material, radioactive waste. Shortly, and next to it, of course, part of it is a landfill. State of Missouri is responsible for regula regulating landfills. And this landfill is a mess and it's been affecting the community for quite a while. And that's why the Attorney General filed the lawsuit. When his report came out uh, the 1st of September, you know, I had, I, I, we tried a lot of ways to get DNR to folks and, and the, the folks who are there. And, and honestly, they're good folks who are trying hard. They don't have the expertise that they need. But they have reached out, they have, but everything that happens in this landfill, according to the lawsuit and the laws, has to be negotiated with Republic Services, okay? So if we want them to do something, Republic Services has to agree. If they don't agree, they go to a judge, and a judge has to decide, okay? That's sort of where we, where we are with this for a state, for, from the state level and the federal level. That's where the two have such a, 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 a unique dynamic to it, and why there's such an issue with it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the response of what I'm trying to do, what I want the state to, to, to do, and what I presented to the moms and the community. I, I think we're all in agreement here, a little bit different nuances, but let me start with this. First, um, okay, they're all four up there, but it's not a big deal. First, I think I want the governor to order the order DNR to independently, independently without Republic Services, determine the best way to slow or stop the fire. Best way to slow or stop the fire. It's been said that the fire can't be stopped. That may be true. But we need to slow or stop this fire. These worst case scenarios that Ed brought up, they just can't happen. A light, dusty, radioactive material three miles from here could hit, could hit business areas, could hit our homes. It would take years. There's places that have been affected by radioactive material that have never been allowed to return to. Okay? It's not scary, but it is. And we have to ensure that those, things, those two things do not happen. The difference between what I would consider an emergency, a state of emergency, and what I'm asking for here is I need the state. I need someone to be prepared. They have to engage the professionals that know how to deal with this sort of thing, pay them independently of Republic Services, do what's necessary, and be ready, ready and at the, at the call, at the beck and call, to get in there and take over and do it. That, when, if that were to occur, I think then there could potentially be a state of emergency that would be called, and frankly, we'd send teams in, hire team professionals, and we'd slow the fire. Now the second part of this is, and it's, it's just as important, while we do this, there is a, there is a thought, there's two things here that, that are, are, are concerning. One is, can we stop the fire? The problem is we don't know. If we don't know, then we have to say we can't. Okay? And the other thing is, this fire started over here, and I know Republic Services uh, is responsible for how the fire started, but these fires start. So there's no, there's no guarantee that we wouldn't have another fire starting in, 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 in close to the radioactive material. So part of this is, and I want the governor to do it, and believe me, I've talked a lot to the governor and to the staff, okay? We, we have the request in, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we can get a response that we need. But we need to tell the EPA that they need to start removing the radioactive waste closest to the fire and move back. Get it out of the way of the fire. If the radioactive waste was not there, this is a different issue. And there are concerns and impacts to the community, but it does not threaten the metropolitan area without the radioactive waste. At least we don't think. So we need the EPA to get off their butt. Pardon me. We need the EPA to get up here. Bring, I think FUSRAP is just working north here. Bring them in and get this radioactive waste removed from closest to the fire. See, they clap because they want to give me a moment to breathe. Um, 
I will tell you very clearly that I think the radioactive waste needs to be removed from this site completely, every bit of it, and gotten out. It's too close to the groundwater. It's in Tornado Alley. It's in the uh, earthquake zone. This stuff will be a danger to this community for as long as it sits. It needs to go, and there's no reason for us to sit and have to have these meetings and have these poor moms be away from their kids and the things they want to do to be able to fight this. here when the airport when they built that runway the reason I mention that is that the third aspect here all of these things by the way all result from the fire it has nothing to do with the radioactive waste I'm speaking from the state side the state side we control we are responsible responsible for the uh, landfill so everything has to do with the fire I've been around buyouts and they're an ugly thing they are some people do okay, but if you're upside down in your home and you know how home values have purposes over the year, gone up and down, all of these issues, buyouts are a tough thing. And it's especially a tough thing for the mobile home court that's close to there because the homes aren't worth a lot and there are people living there that are paid for their home and they pay for a fee for the lot and that sort of thing. So I've been through that. I am reluctant to, to want to be part of that, but honestly the people that live close to uh, the landfill and the way I put it here, you can see. Um, at one time, where public services had to open up this, this hole, this dump, and they said the people within this certain area, and I think it's about a mile away, but they had a very, very geographic, very distinct geographic area. I think anybody that was affected then should be given a buyout, should be taken out of not only harm's way, but the loss of their home, and frankly, chronic exposure to this material is unknown. I don't care, you could be at a bus stop for 15 minutes, won't hurt you, but if you stay there for five years and breathe in that stuff, you're gonna, you're gonna be harmed. So we need a buyout, and with that, and the last portion of it, I think property assurance is important to this too, because once they start opening up that landfill, we don't know what's gonna happen with that. One other thing, and I didn't have it on here, just I'm an air traffic controller by trade, I worked at Lambert for 20 years, so if anybody tells you the airport can't let that happen because airplanes, you call me, because I was at that airport when they had airplanes. Okay? <laughs> they can do it. Um, I think that's it. I'll be around. I'll be around if you guys have specific questions. But this is what I'm presenting to the governor, uh, what we're trying to get across, and the way I think, I think the state should respond to ensure the safety of this community. Thanks so much. Okay, real quick. Um, state Rep. Otto said, that he didn't want us moms to have to be up here doing this, and we don't want to be, really. It's not what we wanted to be when we grew up. Um, I want you to know that I grew up in Hazelwood. I was exposed to Coldwater Creek. I lived in the same neighborhood that they're finding radiation in, St. Sen Park. I had lived in the same neighborhood where they're finding the radioactive waste in people's backyards. My parents didn't know. I know. I've raised my own four children. Um, 1.8 miles away from this landfill, they are being exposed possibly to the same exact waste that I was exposed to. I have systemic lupus. I'm sick. There's days I can't get out of bed. But I am going to do everything I can, along with Dawn, and I hope the rest of you in here, to fight for our kids and fight for our future and save this community and our children. talk real quick about some emergency response things. Um, at, right after him, we will start question and answers. Oh, we're going to have Mark Dietrich with the local emergency planning committee. He's going to address you guys. Then we'll start some question and answer period. My speech will hopefully be uh, short and sweet. Um, after the last community meeting last month, there was a group of citizens that got together. We wanted to address some of the concerns that we've heard for the what if, what if with St. Louis County. Uh, those that are in the group, if you want to just stand up to be recognized, there's about eight of us. several hours together the first night and we wanted to meet with Mark Dietrich who's the uh, local emergency planning commissioner 
and make sure that we didn't waste his time. So we put together a list of many questions. I think it was about three pages long. Mark spent about three hours with us one night to go over each and every one of those questions in detail. So tonight I'm going to, if you're not going to recommend, Mark Dietrich to come up and answer a lot of the questions that you may have about the emergency plan. something really quickly about Mark because I know this is where you guys can have some questions. He did not put this waste here. He did not start the fire. He works for St. Louis County. His job, and for those of you that are from St. Charles and surrounding areas, his job is to come up with a plan should the worst case scenarios happen at this site. So it's very important. Your input is welcome. As Howard said, there is a group that is dedicated to finding out what you want to know, what you do and don't like about the plan. You know, we've got a lot of this little intricate stuff going on here. I'm going to give you the floor. Please be nice to him. I know you guys are all scared. He cannot remove the radioactive waste. And he cannot put this fire out. That, that is not within his purview. What he can do is look at the situation and try as best as he can with what he has to work with to keep you all safe. Chairman of the LAPC. The LAPC is the Local Emergency Planning Commission, uh, which is a commission, I won't go into too much detail, but it is mandated by federal law. Uh, it's mandated by federal law that uh, every jurisdiction has an LAPC. I am the chairman of the LAPC because I am, uh, my full time job is Director of Emergency Management for St. Louis County. So that comes with that job. Uh, a short period of time, hours at the most. That gives us the opportunity to find out what it is that we're dealing with. We can send monitors in and meters in and find out exactly what's in the air and find out exactly where it is. At that point, once we know that, we can then, if necessary, start an evacuation. Okay. What I would urge you to do and what I urge people to do all the time when we're talking about disasters is to create your own disaster plan for your family. I can't give you something that's going to work for every single family in this room tonight because we are all different. We have different uh, makeup of our family. We have different needs. So you really need to look at that. And the things that you need to look at are how are you going to communicate? What is, what is everyone's phone numbers? Where are people throughout the day? And this kind of planning is really should be done for any type of emergency, not just this. This is pretty generic kind of stuff that we talk about. It applies to every kind of emergency. And then if, in the event we get to a situation where you would have to evacuate, where are you going to go? We will have shelters open, but quite honestly, a shelter is not a place you want to stay for a long time. It's just, it's not, uh, you know, very comfortable. It provides for all your basic needs, but it's not something you want to spend more than a night or two. So if you have the ability to go somewhere else, I would encourage you to do that. But if for whatever reason you can't, the shelters will be provided for you. So I think those are kind of some basic uh, things that I wanted to make sure uh, everybody had understand. And I don't know, Don, are we going to take questions now? Is that the plan or? We are going to take questions, however, we're going to try to have people come use the mic because there's so many people here that it's hard to see. Um, we're going to clear a path here, so. So if you have a question, please come up to the mic. We will try to get those questions answered. Right, if it's right up here, that's fine. We can move it around a little bit. Maria Chappelle-Ladal, I do have a question. My staff and I have been going over the ordinances at St. Louis County Council. And apparently there was a plan that was suggested in 2014. However, that has not been adopted by County Council. The problem with that is if we do have one of these events to happen, 
you do not get reimbursed by SEMA, and you do not get reimbursed by FEMA. So my question is, when is county council going to adopt these policies that you've been talking about, I want to say, since 2013? The plan was put together in 2014, but it was not adopted. It is absolutely important that these policies are made official by county council, because if we do have an emergency situation, um, a lot of our firefighters and other emergency folks are going to um, be in a bad situation because they won't get reimbursed. We went through this in Ferguson. And the problem with that is that it took over a year for police departments to get reimbursed. If this is not in the policy for St. Louis County, County Council, for all of St. Louis County, it's going to be a problem. And that's one of the reasons, in addition to asking the governor for a state of emergency, we need some real results from the St. Louis County Council, and we need it now. And I'm not part of the St. Louis County Council, so I can't answer that question. But I can tell you that that is an annex to our basic emergency operations plan, which has been adopted by the County Council. Next question. If we can get the mic to you, we'll, we will try to do that. It's not on. I'm not more than a question as a statement. You've seen this screen that said Chernobyl. I am from Chernobyl. I moved from Chernobyl 20 years ago to save my daughter. My in-laws, both of them, died from cancer. My aunt died from cancer. My 30 years old cousin diagnosed with cancer. My mom, cancer survived. My dad passed away from brain cancer last year. I am the face of Chernobyl. Do you want that for your children? Do you want it for yourselves? Send out people. You can't be quiet anymore. People there where that's their strategy will play. I was 17 years old. I was a student teacher at that time. After four years, it was uh, April 26, 1986. I saw people evacuated from the zone with shaved heads. I've taught my very first class. I'm a teacher. I've taught a class of four years old children, children of Chernobyl, who were born after Chernobyl. They had no teeth by the time of five years old. My friend, best friend, she's an oncologist in Minsk. That's the capital of Belarus. I'm not from Ukraine. Chernobyl touched not just Ukraine. It's right on the border between Belarus and Ukraine. My native city, 208 miles from Chernobyl. Kids were getting sick there. It's sad that it's the, the results of Chernobyl, the, the radiation was felt in Sweden, 700 miles away from Chernobyl. In Germany, 550 miles from Chernobyl. I was told that it's not a Chernobyl. Yes, it's nothing, goodness. But our distance in St. Louis County is much less than 800 miles. We will not be talking about Ram Stadium, who can actually, county and state can afford to put millions of dollars in that country. Everyone who will pay for all of those expenses for the cancer, for the all other issues, for lupus, for breathing problem, for asthma, who will pay for that? This is this is a problem. If we talk about it, we're gonna go bankrupt just by paying our health expense. There is no way, there is no way regular everyday person can cover those expenses. And if we're going to keep quiet, if we community going to keep quiet, it's going to last forever. I'm not from Bridgeton. I'm not from St. Charles. I'm from Chesterfield. But I think this is my business. This is my Small 
preschool in my house. That's their lives too. They parents, most of them immigrants, and most of them from Ukraine and Belarus. They came to save their children from radiation. And they got in the epicenter of that horror. I don't blame, you know, life brings you life. But there is a capability and responsibility, and people were elected to defend your interests, my interests, everybody's interests. And whose interests are they defending? My interests. Whose interests are they defending? Somewhere in color, where, wherever they are, definitely they are safe. What about your children? What about your life? What about we need, if, if it's an evacuation plan, mandatory evacuation? I'm self-employed. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to hundreds and thousands of people who is not going to get sick days? Who is not going to be, have to be compensated for that? I think that the government has to be held responsible. And they have stopped pretending to be an ostrich. When I was walking in, I heard the people saying, we hope that they tell us that everything is okay. Don't hope. Right. You know, that is a situation with an ostrich. You know, when ostrich is scared, they hide their head, but they leave everything else outside. <laughs> so that's what is the situation is about, you know, what we are in now. So that's it. My, my statement is over, but that's no question. else you can get to get on the phone and get those letters written to all those representatives and, and the contact of the EPA so we can get this thing resolved. I've lived in Bridgeton since 1983 and raised two children here and I, I don't want my house to be worth nothing because some rich person who owns a landfill doesn't give a rip about what, how we live. Okay, I'm gonna get you. Yeah, come here, here, let's move this way. Can you move this way a little bit so it's not? And then, I just have a question about what will the evacuation procedures be for the, the Pattonville schools? I have a child in high school and in the elementary school. Like, who's gonna make the decision about if they're going to stay in the school? Or if they're going to be evacuated, are they going to send them home with buses to houses that the parents aren't home? What's going to happen with that? Well, and that's, uh, we have talked with uh, Pattonville schools. Uh, we continue to talk with all the school districts in the area. And it, all I can do is give them recommendations. And my recommendation for schools is the same as I have for residences. That is, initially you want to shelter in place until you know exactly what's going on. We will be in contact with them in the event something happens to let them know, uh, first of all, if they need to continue to shelter in place, if it's safe to evacuate, if what areas are not safe to go into, if that's the possibility. So it will be a, uh, a definitely a dialogue between uh, the first responders and the emergency management and the school district to let them know exactly what's going on. It'll be a very fluid situation. Uh, and I know this isn't probably a really good answer to your question, but again, like I said earlier, until we know what's happening, I can't give you specifics, but that is the basic first one. Hi, Mark. My name is Cole Kelly, and I'm not from Bridgeton or Hazelwood. I'm actually from Ladoo. And I have a real issue with the fact that, you know, there's this radius of 10 miles that is going on that is circulating this map. And 
I feel like so many people in St. Louis are not even aware that this is going on. I can't tell you how many people I have talked to over the last couple of weeks who have no clue that this exactly. landfill is burning and has all of these toxic gases going on. It feels like the movie of civil action right here in St. Louis. And I want to be prepared. I have three children in school. And if this emergency plan existed, why are we not aware of it? First of all, I just want to touch on the 10 mile radius that I keep hearing about. I'm not really sure where that came from. It did not come from me or my office. Uh, we have never said that. Uh, so how far does it reach? Again, we won't know how far anything is going to reach until the event happens. I mean, I understand that's not an answer that you want to hear. So if you get that right, actually, the other way around, so that this is Okay. this is over, you guys can go and speak with him. That's a great question. Because somebody other than two moms needs to be doing this. Yeah. Yeah. My, my question is, when I received a letter from the Orchard Fern School District, it was so vague. And who was feeding the school district the information? It said, there's a hazardous waste situation. That's bogus. Hazardous waste can be, you know, disposal of nail polish remover. This is so major and intense. And for me to feel careful to put the care of my six-year-old, if there's a shelter in process and they're telling me that this is a more mild situation than what it really is, I mean, what information are they getting? And I'm with this lady that, there's no, if it wasn't for this group of moms that made this Facebook page, I would have not known. And now I'm getting a letter that has no, no security to me as far as what's gonna happen to my kids. If there is a shelter in process, or teachers are, the school district going to have any kind of like training? Where is the comfort to really follow the leadership with this emergency plan? Okay, again, you're, you're asking me questions I can't answer because I do not work for the school district. Okay, as, as Dawn explained, and I am happy to help with emergency planning because that's what I do. But that is all I can do. And all I can do is give the information. People can take it if they want, or they can choose to do something else. I've had a lot of people tell me that the emergency planning information that we've given them is not sufficient. And I apologize for that, but it is the best information that is available. And that's what we're doing. I, I have a question. St. Louis County has known that this has been going on, the government part. You state representatives, our, um, our federal representatives, our federal senators, why isn't this an EPA issue that they can take eminent domain for the goodness of the community. They can take down homes if they want to build the Ram Stadium. They can take down homes for some of the Why can't they not take this away from the Republic? 
uh, uh, investors. Why? And uh, to me, this is more urgent than anything else going on in the city. Keep in mind that there were maybe 4,000 people on the Facebook page two weeks ago. We're up to about 13,000 now. That's 13,000 people that are learning of this, and it's going to take all of you to make phone calls. Dawn and I are on the phone constantly with elected officials and agencies. Everyone has to step up to the plate here. Everyone. This isn't just our problem. It's not just Bridgeton's problem. It is a St. Louis, St. Charles regional problem. And if we want to get answers, we need to go to the elected officials that can be our voice and get the answers that we need to have. But it takes work. For example, uh, if a chlorine tanker truck were to turn over on the highway right outside this building, it would not be prudent for everyone inside this building to go out and look at the chlorine tanker truck. Leave. It would be best to stay inside. If that is the, the same scenario, essentially the same scenario, it's best to stay inside. That is the best um, advice that any uh, coming from the CDC. Are you familiar with McCall, India? Are you yes, I am. 1984. And on December 2nd, these people were not aware of what that chemical company was doing. And they stayed in shelter, and the tens of thousands of those people died. People still have to breathe. For you to say that shelter in place is the right thing to do without having any other precautions, without knowing the jet stream, how it's moving, without talking to any of these first responders on how they're going to do which neighborhood goes first. It is uncalled for and disrespectful to the people who live in this region for you not to have a better plan. Yes. It is irresponsible for you to be at this plan. We have not been able to But after I learned about Bhopal, India, after I learned about that and all those people who were in the proximity, 15 miles, 15 miles of people who were closest to this chemical spill, they all died instantly. Instantly. And then they still have generations of people who still have problems with their health. There are people who are now have their, their DNA mutations generation after generation. That's without the fire. So even without the fire, we have a contamination issue, and it should have been dealt with a long time ago, and we still need to deal with that now because there are people who are getting rare cancers, and they're still dying. We need a better response from St. Louis County, period. Yeah. Mason. I live in Spanish Village subdivision, so I've been dealing with this for over five years. What I want everybody to understand here that you didn't see in all those slides, those pictures that they showed where it's six football fields that are on fire, none of that ground has been tested for radioactive waste. None of it. None of it. Well, he's with St. Louis County. You can't tell us why the EPA is not doing their job. This is the job of the EPA and the DNR. They've never tested any of that ground that's burning right now. As a resident of Spanish Village, we've been dealing with this. We've been sheltering in our homes for over five years. We can't open our windows. Our eyes burn when we walk outside. We vomit when we get out of our cars. This is what we've been dealing with. We know there's something that dirt. If it's where they're telling us it's at, and then they're telling us now, the Attorney General saying, it's outside of their of the perimeter of the property. Why would it not be right there in the middle then? It didn't jump over what's on fire. But they won't test it. They haven't tested it. We don't know what's burning right now. We don't know what's going into those flares right now. We have no clue. Every day. Yeah. Next question. My, my question is, is it part of the Emergency Planning Committee's responsibility to let the public know what is going on? Because I moved here in June with my four children, 
And we are packing up and leaving in a few weeks. And everybody in my community that I have told thinks that I am crazy to believe that there's nucleus, nuclear waste next door. It needs to come from a public official. It can't come from a Facebook page. They don't believe it. Exactly. Hey, guys. Guys, the questions for St. Louis County about this, I, I know Mark is emergency response. He can't do anything to help it. There are people in the room that can. There's County Executive Paul. Sorry, from the County Executive's office, Paul. Help me, Hamill. Hamble? Yes. Not to speak, but he's here to report that he's listening. Okay? We need to know what's in there. Okay, I have, hold on. I have a bunch of questions up here that people have turned in. I'm going to go with one of these questions up here right and now. We'll, yeah, go with and we'll go back out. How soon will citizens find out if the fire meets the waste danger issues? What channels other than Nixol will be used? I don't want to give this to you again. <laughs> that information will go out to all local media. We will also use social media. And it will go out national, also the National Weather Service, no weather radio. No. Now, the, the issue with the sirens is that the sirens are not meant to be heard inside. They're meant to be heard out here outside. Um, the other issue that I have with the sirens is the fact that I know when the sirens go off for a tornado, what you're supposed to do is go in the basement and turn on the TV or radio and find out what's going on. But I know the reality of the situation is a lot of people go outside to see what's going on, and we don't want to draw people outside. We want them to stay inside until we know what's going on. Next question. Okay. If it's important enough for the county, your county group, to make this plan, isn't it important enough to inform the citizens of the county right now about what's going on? I mean, if this is so important that you agree that you're making this plan, shouldn't the general public know about it? We have social media, we have radio, we have commercials. I mean, granted, the news people thankfully put it on the news, but how many people watch the news? How many people have been oblivious for so long? Why can't we spread the news? People need to know what's going on. The evacuation plan, wouldn't it make more sense to have something, you know, educate the people on, well, if the, if the wind is northeast, then this is going to happen. Or if it's heading to the west, then this is what's going to happen. We need to have some kind of information. How are we going to get kids home safe from school? How do you how do you get that number of kids out of school buildings and home safely or out of harm's way? Okay, so to kind of piggyback on hers, how do we get this to the news? How do we get to to Fox, to KMOV, how do we get the evacuation plans to them? They are here right now. The media is here. KMO. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, there was something up there talking about the school district, and it said that Brittner was on there. I am a Rittner parent. I have gotten nothing in the mail. I have a friend here who is also a Rittner parent. We have gotten nothing from our students coming home. So I was told somebody was here from Rittner, and they were informed that you have told us, so I need to know why my school district is being left out. That might be something that you have to ask the school district, is that correct? Because it's up to yes. them to send those letters out? Yes, Oh uh, yeah, there's a council member from uh, a council member from St. Anne in the Rittner district that was here, and I don't see her right now. But her name's Amy Pelker, and she's fantastic. Sadie is St. Anne. She's a great person and a great asset, and I would see she's waving. Amy's fantastic, and I would get with her. Okay, I didn't know that there was a microphone. She can speak and say. Do you want a microphone, Amy? Answered? Are you fine? <laughs> Um, they didn't get a letter from Rittner School District, and they want to know if something, if their school district can do something. 
I mean, I think you have to go to your school district and ask them that because it's not a mandatory letter. Next question. My question is, we know how far or approximately how far the fire is from the radiation. How about like 500 feet you put out, state of emergency, get the hell out of here. Is there a way that you guys are able to know where the fire is each day? Where do we go to get these people involved to make a state of emergency so they can get this taken care of? Because I'm all about protests and I'm walking out of here doing it now. <laughs> we have asked the red lines to give us some indication and we have not gotten them. And the petition. Oh, we have the petition for the state of emergency. Next question. So you've been saying that we need to get the Corps of, Army Corps of Engineers authorized. How do we get them authorized? Who do we contact for that? What is your plan for getting them authorized? Anybody who might know the answer. The only way our Doug can answer it. The only way to get the Army Corps of Engineers up is for legislation. So Congress. Um, federal. So Roy Blunt and Wagner. Senator McCaskill and Congressman McClay. An act of Congress. Act of Congress. Oh, the National Congress. Yes. Of National Congress. However, you're lucky though. Senator Blunt is on the appropriations. So that is his energy and water division. And both him and Ann Wagner can get this passed. Don, no. Don, I want to add to that. So what's happening at the federal government, we want that latest delegation letter that was on the slideshow earlier. That went to the Department of Energy. Uh, Senator Blunt was on Channel 5 News uh, earlier this week saying that he thinks that the Corps should be put in charge, that they'll do a better job than the EPA. We need him because he sits in the majority, in the Senate, and he's in leadership, and he sits on the appropriate, several appropriation subcommittees. With the federal budget needing to be passed in the very near future, we need him to put a piece of language into the budget legislation. This has to happen before the end of the year. We run out of money as a federal government to put the Corps of Engineers in charge of the Westlake landfill. This is something that can be done before the end of the year. This is something that has to be done before the end of the year. Next year is a presidential election year and ain't nothing getting done, uh, less than what's already happening. And we need this to happen now. Congresswoman Ann Wagner, same for her. The House is in a bit of a disarray right now, but she's in leadership. She can make some moves to get this language put onto the House side of the budget bill to put the Corps of Engineers in charge. So everybody leave today, call your fed both of your senators, McCaskill and Blunt, and call Congresswoman Wagner if you're in her district, or Clay if you're in his district, and ask for them to put the Corps of Engineers in charge, include it in the budget, and make sure that that happens this year. Hey, I have something additional to say. So, I think that both of us, most of us here are just trying to figure out what we personally can do to help spread the word. And that's actually why I was here at the meeting tonight, and all my friends I've been mentioning to them about this problem, they say, well, what can we do? You know, I'm just one person. Is there somebody here who feels comfortable writing letters? Because like when I I want to write a letter to my to my senators and stuff, but I don't know how to word it. I don't know much about this issue to make it sound you know professional. Can somebody here write letters for for each of our representatives so then they can send out a link to us and we can all just all we have to do is address the letter and sign it. Change um, that word. Yeah, change that word has a yeah. petition, but. If, if, if they can make a letter for each one of the representatives, that would help so much. It needs to be a handwritten, it needs to be personal, and if you're on Facebook, you know that this week we have been targeting Senator Blunt by making phone calls. Phone calls are very effective because they have to answer the phone. So phone calls, emails, personal letters, every day. Make it a part of your routine every single day. Call them every single day. Next. Don't hurry. Oh, okay. All right, I'll just go ahead and go there. Uh, 
Um, I'm pretty heavily involved in uh, nonprofit work involving uh, toxic exposure illnesses in the military, and specifically uh, toxins from burn pits uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is very similar. I know it seems that everyone's very focused on the uh, scary idea about you know, these fires hitting uh, this toxic waste, but I'm here to tell you that uh, particulate matter is uh, the scary name of the game and that comes in normal burn pits and I will tell you from just what this lady said over here earlier about uh, when she gets out of the car it's bad enough where her eyes are burning and she's feeling sick um, that's very scary um, and uh, what I would like to know is is the state or whatever appropriate authorities checking on the air samples for quality and what particular matters are found in this immediate vicinity. Well, ingestion and inhalation are your two really big ways to introduce this stuff, and it's bad news. The answer is that there are monitors like area ray monitors, but as far as particulate matter, no. That's what gets you. Right, and that's what we're the most concerned about, should anything happen or be happening at this landfill. This lady. I'm not a mathematician, but um, we said they said it could hit within three to six months, right? The budget process with government goes, you said, till maybe the end of the year. So the report came out September, October, November, December. We're four months already into a three to six month window. I'm not comfortable with that. Okay, well, and I will say this, the three to six month window is a worst case scenario. It could take longer to hit, but that is the short, scary time frame. And it's not the only thing that can happen at this site, so you're correct. There's what I meant to say is this thing about trying to get yeah. the, the budget in um, Washington, D.C. to put something in about this. We, we don't have time to wait for that to happen. Well, there's an executive order that can happen, too. So there are ways to get it. You're correct. That would expedite the process. And how do we get that? You're gonna, Senator Roy Blunt and okay. Congresswoman Ann Wagner need to be the targets. They are not the only one. All are affected in this district, but they are the two that are in leadership. We're not picking on them for any other reason than they can give us what we want. Okay. This lady right here does... Oh, no. You're, you. Okay. Sorry. Goodness gracious. Hi, um, my name is Shadwafi Yusuf and I go to Patton High School. Hi guys. Alright, so um, as people know, we have a very large marching band. And most of us go out in the morning and we actually do smell the very bad smell. And our eyes burn and it's not a comfortable thing for any student to have. And I was currently diagnosed with MS in 2013 and I live in Bridgeton. So, as you guys know, and we don't know how I got this diagnosis. And not only that, but I was also uh, diagnosed with an immune disease. Also don't know how that came. And um, as you all know, the landfill does cause many diseases. And as a student and as a child, you know, with wearing parents and wearing neighbors, this isn't comfortable for anyone. And myself, I'm angered. And yeah, I know I'm a kid and I'm a teenager or whatever, but seeing other be like people being affected by this, it makes not only a, like just, just a Facebook page doesn't help out. And if you know that this thing is happening, the people in order and the people taking charge, why aren't you, if you know this is affecting not only your generation, but also our future, why don't, just, why don't you just stop it? I mean, if you have nothing else but that choice and you see that every other person is angry from the situation, and you know that your kids and your future is going to be affected, and you're saying that after five years the fire possibly might end, why don't you just take effect right now? That's all I'm saying. As people, we all can take effect. I mean, I'm not supporting this in your life. I'm going to gather all the thousands of students that are here to all these protests. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. I have a qu another question I'm going to read real quick. This is going to be the last question that I'll read from the papers here. The rest of these questions, we will get those out and answer to you as soon as possible. Okay, look for it on Facebook or email or however we need to get it to you, we will get it to you. Um, this guy right here has had his hand up for a long time. Oh yeah, I forgot. 
Yeah. Hi, my name is Shannon. Uh, I am actually a homeowner uh, about 3.1 miles away from the landfill. Um, my question is, with all the talk about, uh, you know, response to what we should do if something happens when we know that it's three or six months away, why are we not talking about mass evacuations right, right now and getting these people to safe distances away from this landfill? Do it now before something happens. Why are we not talking about that? We are talking about our goals up here, and on number one, you notice that we want to give the people in Spanish Village in the mobile home park and within one mile from the fence line of the property, fence line property of the landfill, we want them to have the choice. We want to start with them because they are the ones that are in the most danger and they are the ones that have had to put up with this the longest. So that is number one on our goal. Dawn and I, we don't live in Spanish Village. We don't live a mile, or I'm a mile at point eight and Dawn's two miles. So. We have to get the people in Spanish Village and those mobile home parks and the condos. We need to get them some safety and some and some precautions in place for them. Next question. Okay, um, I would like to, to ask Mark when he speaks of these places of shelter. From what has been done for us thus far, number one, where are the places of shelter? How many people are they going to hold? How do we get ourselves and our children there? Can we not stay in our own homes and prepare for this possible catastrophe ourselves? And what can we do and what should we do to stay at place and in home? There are probably traffic jams or whatever. You can't just be out. You need to be someplace. Right. There are approximately, we work with the Red Cross for sheltering, they manage all the shelter operations. There are approximately 800 different locations that are used as shelter uh, in the St. County area. I just wish, you know what, I just went to the American Red Cross two weeks ago and they knew nothing about Bridgeton. They knew absolutely nothing. I'm sick of this. They knew nothing. I was there for an entire hour. to happen. I know it's that when fear strikes large corporations, that's what's going to make people change. And I just feel like if you were to make all of St. Louis aware of this and to make them afraid, I mean, I know we don't want to live in fear and be afraid, but that fear is ultimately what is going to make businesses move out. It's going to make housing prices go down. And I know we don't want to see that, 
But when that happens, I think that's going to make our public services finally you know, realize that they've got to do something about this. So wouldn't it be better to let everybody know? I know Republic doesn't care, but when everybody starts being afraid, like everyone, all of St. Louis, all of Missouri, and it starts driving the economy down, 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 and money starts fleeing from this, then we're going to have a response. So why not do that? Next question. I'm not sure who exactly is going to be able to answer this, whether it's the Just Moms, um, Mr. Dietrich, or Mr. Otter, I'm not sure who's here. Um, unfortunately, I work about 150 feet away from the very edge of the landfill. So those pictures that you were seeing tonight um, of those different soot, um, fires and that sort of thing, we actually can walk across the street and be a part of that. I have not seen a single um, plan in place, unfortunately, for businesses. I've seen a lot of plans in place for homeowners and different plans that we want for buyouts and that sort of thing. My employer, employer cannot do anything because of the landlord, and the landlord cannot do anything because the EPA has not said that there's a problem. Is there any suggestion of where we can go to get answers or to bring in someone to our facility to help get answers, questions answered because we don't know what to do at this point? Hello. I would recommend that your, whoever the bosses, whoever are, contact the local first responders and then make contacts through them on who would come in and educate because it's very important. We care so much about these workers. We are so worried about you guys. You guys bring this in all the time. Then you go home and you take it to your kids. Right? We're worried about the workers in the landfill too. What I want to suggest to everybody is remember you have a county council that you can show up to next week. Even if you live in St. Charles, this now affects you guys too. So you guys have the right, because of something happening in St. Louis County affecting people in another district in St. Charles, you have the right to show up to county council. Uh, and your elected officials, you need to be calling all your state reps and telling them you want them to address the landfill situation. I'm gonna tell you something, and we haven't talked about this. Republic Services, if you live in St. Right. Charles, you live in Chesterfield or Ellisville, your representatives have signed on to a fake coalition that Republic pays. Your representatives have signed on to a coalition that does not want this radioactive waste removed. It is fully funded and paid for by Republic. We will put that list up on our Facebook page so that you can look who your state reps are, look who your council members are, and see if they're, they are on that list. Because that's the first place you need to start. Stage. Thank you for all your diligence, all of your information, everything that you just like. Mark, I know you guys have been through. Thank you very much. My question is actually for you. I think one of the things that would help a lot of us and calm a lot of fears is a little transparency. What are these events? There's general plans put out there. There's no details. Nobody knows what's going on. I have the utmost reason in the world to get out. And I need to know, how am I going to do that? How am I going to protect my child? I have watched what has happened to a family through this landfill. I lost a girl very dear to my heart. And I refuse to let that happen to my daughter, but when can we expect that from your office? Is that something that you can give us, a timeline of some transparency for everyone? Um, I'll let him answer, but the fact is, and he'll agree, until there's an event at this site, you're not going to know what route you can or can't take because they're not going to know the direction the wind's blowing. Am I right? Am I right? I mean, they can lay one out for each direction so you know, but you're going to have to get on Nixle because you're going to have to find out which ones are blocked and which ones are not. Guys, that is why it is so important that we not let something happen at this site. Okay? That, listen, it's very important. This, is, this does not have to happen at this site. There are things that can be done to make it so that we never have to deal with this. I have uh, two questions. They're brief and I promise somebody else. Um, I'm a mom, and as a Rittner parent said, and, and the same as Pattonville, at least in my school, we haven't gotten anything. We don't know. Um, 
But my question is, is I work a quarter of a mile from the dump. If something happens, I'm leaving, and there will be nothing that keeps me from my children. How do I safely get my child out of school? So I can safely leave with my child to get where we need to go, where we could at least be safe a little longer. How do we do that? You have to talk to your school. Okay. All right. And then. That's the first responders. That's the first responders. I mean, there is no good answer for if something happens at this landfill, guys. There's just not going to be. What do we do? We got to get this fire. This fire either needs to be put out. If it can't be put out, then you're going to have to remove the radioactive waste. You cannot let it waste. Yeah, we do. My next question is. Um, we do. I know that I heard earlier we were watching the live feed in another room because we couldn't hear you guys. So, so many people out here, it's really nice to see that people care and the word is spreading. It's a beautiful thing. Um, there is a buyout plan for homeowners. Um, I'm raising two children and I'm choosing to do that and have another child instead of buying a house right now. It's just how things go. Some people don't have a choice. But what happens to us renters? What happens to the people that don't own homes? The only thing we own is our cars and our lives. What happens then? That is because then I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to raise and take care of my children. That is something we are very concerned about, by the way. And you know, um, we I believe is it on there? Does it say for renters? On there? Yeah. We have renters on here. We are trying to find a way so that you guys are protected if you live within this area as well. Does that make sense? We, are, we do not know right now what that looks like, but there are plans out there for renters. We could really use your help. If you want to kind of help us head up that whole subgroup, that would be great. Okay. All right, we are going to take maybe two more questions and then we're gonna close. Um, we still have a lot of questions, I know. Um, this, 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 this lady right here has had her hand up. Let's cut it off. One, two. This lady. Okay. We're, we're going to accept questions and we're going to put them on Facebook. Written questions that you may have. So, real quick, let's grab the lady that's standing up back here. Where's the mic? Okay, well, I just have a couple of issues. First of all, I'm a product of Coldwater Creek. I have five autoimmune diseases, lost my dad at 35, my aunt at 50, my cousin has MS, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to make sure that my kids don't live the life that we or I have to live currently. So um, as far as communication that is going out to the businesses and stuff, I work for the Boeing company. I have been corresponding for two weeks with individuals there who seem to have their head in the sand and not know anything that's going on. So any information I take from the page and put it out there, they have no idea about Nixle or anything else. So as being the biggest employer within the area, whether you live here or, or not, if you work here, you're impacted and people just want to blow you off and laugh and think it's really funny and think they're not impacted because they live in O'Fallon or they live in Troy. But if you work here, you're impacted. So how's the communication? How is a big company like the Boeing Company not aware of this issue? So, so my name is Matt Martin. I am not a representative of the Boeing Company, but I am an IT at the Boeing Company. And my, one of the applications we do I can't help everybody, but the Boeing employees will get a message on but your it's phone. On your, on, our phone. on your phone. But that's only if you go through Nixle. Nope. The Boeing company will actually get it for their employees because it's part of a system that we made, that my team actually supports. But for everybody else, I, I can't really go there, but for Boeing employees, I can tell you, you will get the message through your cell phone because it's all set up to that. Okay, well I've made up my own cards and I have distributed them throughout the neighborhood for Nixle. And, and I'll catch so you outside here because I want to get your information also so we can talk about, maybe talk about this more. Okay, yeah. thank you. I wish we could, right? Thank you. Okay. I want to get her question. She has had her hand up for a very long time. 
<coughs> Sorry. I'm a student at the University of Missouri St. Louis and I've done some reading on the history of the illegal dumping of the waste and what I'd like to know is what has been done to require the original company which done which has dumped the waste to deal with this and Cotter Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Edison, what has been done for them to pay for relocation costs, for healthcare costs, for alerting the public? What has been done and what can be done to prosecute them? Under Superfund, and they are responsible for this site. They are, you know, and they are going to be responsible for paying for anything that happens at the site, just like Republic. But part of that responsibility is also going to be split with your Department of Energy. Your federal government is a responsible party. You can repeat that again. Your federal government is a responsible party on paper for what happens at Westlake Landfill. And Exxon will write the check for Cotter, is our understanding. Mallinckrodt, when they entered into a contract with the DOE, the DOE took away all Malacrot signed away their ability to be charged in just about anything. They have immunity. It's all the federal government took over that responsibility that anything that happened, and Byron DeLear, raise your hand, Byron, has the actual contract, if you guys want to see it, where the federal government swore to be solely responsible for the mess that ensued from the Manhattan Project. One more, and that's going to be it. Okay, my question is just basically for, I guess, people who are still in my position. I am a 27-year-old mother of three children. My husband and I both live in the Brookside subdivision, so we're fairly close to all of this. I grew up in Bridgeton my whole life. I'm just concerned about this the whole three to six months, which I know everybody is, and I know that it's only an estimate of the worst-case scenario. My question is, aside from stopping it and getting rid of it, What's our best case scenario? Because my family is trying to figure out how to move now. We don't know, is moving right now a realistic option? Should we be concerned with moving? I'm also a student at Lindenwood University. I attend the satellite campus at Westport Plaza. I run a business out of my home. If I have to move, all of these things are over, as well as my education, because I'll have to take a quarter or a couple of quarters off and postpone graduation. This drastically impacts my life. I don't know, am I supposed to move soon? Am I supposed to wait and hope that I can get the attention of people? And I know you can't probably directly answer that, but my question is, is just, what are we looking at? Unfortunately, we can't make those decisions for you. These are all decisions that you guys will have to make on your own. Dawn and I have to make these decisions just like everybody else. Um, I know you guys are wanting concrete. Okay, if you have the funds and they let us move tomorrow, what do you have? The best case scenario is the fire is going to burn for five years per Republic services. Five more years. My property is screwed. I can't move. I have to stay in this stupid whatever is going on. If I we have three goals up here. I understand. We have three goals up here that we have in place that we need to be fighting for. To protect. I understand your frustrations. So move. Where am I going to go? In a van down by the river because I can't sell my house? <laughs> The second, our second goal is property assurance, so that within the five years, or for how, however long the fire is burning, and you decide that you have, you do not want to put up with this anymore, you've thrown your hands up in the air, and you want to go, and you put your house up for sale, and you won't get fair market value, Republic Services will be required to make up that difference. We have to try. I understand that. Okay. Trust me, I do. That's a, per that's a personal choice that all of us are going to have to make. Okay, I'm uh, Harvey Ferdman. I've been working with cars and moms uh, from the very beginning of their awareness of what's going on here. 
Uh, I work at State Representative Bill Otto's office. Uh, so just so you know who I am. Um, I have a question and a comment. The question for Mark is uh, a lot of people are concerned about how do they uh, move about should something happen. You and I have discussed in the past uh, the, the uh, wearing of face masks, and I think there's a particular specification that uh, wouldn't be a bad idea for people to have face masks around. Deferred math and face mask spec. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'll get a spec for you guys and I'll post it on the Facebook page. If you smell the odor, etc., as you heard earlier, there's particulates around and no one's really measuring them. And it's the particulates that are a particular danger because if you inhale them and they get stuck in your lungs, that's when you end up with bad problems. So I will get a spec from somebody uh, as to. I'm sorry? A HEPA filter mask. Okay, a lot of these you can just go to the hardware store and purchase. They're okay, we'll, we'll post them. I'll, I'll get the right specs and I'll post a few guys and hopefully you'll never have to use them. But um, I was talking to my wife and she said, what, what can we do? And I said, well, let's make sure we have a mask around in case things do go sideways. Hopefully, through the efforts of Dawn and others and Bill and me and everyone else and all of you in the room, putting pre public pressure on the folks that can make a difference and get this done. This, this will never turn into a tragedy. The second thing I want to say is another person to put pressure on is, of all people, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. No, that was, that was the foundation. The foundation sold it. The foundation owned about 4 or 5 percent. Bill, Bill Gates owns over 30 percent through his investment term Cascade. And Cascade has a seat on the board of her public services. So they can pay for a lot of things. The public services uh, turns over half a billion dollars a year in profits. So they're, and, and they pay dividends, and Bill Gates' dividends alone could probably buy masks for the entire, entire community. Who knows? But that's another pressure point as well. If you want to go after public services, let's go after uh, someone who, who has a social conscience, which I believe Mr. Gates does. Thank you. Okay, we're going to... Thank you. Uh, Byron Clemens, uh, would the committee please stand up again? The uh, uh, evacuation emergency committee, please stand up again. Everybody who's in the emergency committee. Three of us? There's a, no, there's a few back there. Um, we asked Mark to come here, who's been one of the more transparent government officials we've ever dealt with and we are thankful for that we're also thankful that he released the plan at all there would be no plan if not for him wow. and, that plan is a work in process and we're hearing and we're feeling it ourselves uh, i helped train 300 teachers and teaching assistants and ready by three and CPR they say the kids life within two weeks unfortunately for us that's where we have to start you have to start in your own home we have to look at ourselves and be ready for almost any emergency this is one we hope never happens we hope this doesn't happen we hope this does not happen but we need to be ready in case it does we have first responders in the room. We're worried about them and what risks they're going to be in. And, you know, we talked about the third, three hours, four pages of questions we had from Mark, and we got most of our questions answered that he could answer, honestly, in a forthcoming fashion. Now, our job is to start at home, looking at what we can do in our homes to get ready, our job is to go to our school district and find out what it means to have shelter in place in your school. Our job is to go talk to the teacher and say, have you been trained in Ready in 3? Are you ready to do it? Who's designated to know CPR in your school? Talk to the principal, the school board, the district. Our job is to talk to the mayor of Bridgeton because we know this plan starts with local cities, city council, the mayors of the local cities. That's where this starts. So, 
you know, we have to bring it home. It's not all top down, some of it's bottom up. These are things we hope never happen, but we have to be prepared in case they do. That, that's really the short answer. But I want to thank Mark once again for being here. He's been really... And this is a work in process. Every one of us has questions. It's not over. There are plans that are going to happen. This committee won't go away. The moms are not going to go away. We're not giving up. We need to stick together, every one of us. I've worked on this for decades. It's heartbreaking. But I feel like we're closer now than ever before to getting resolution. I really do. And the EPA is going to be at this meeting coming up. You ought to show up. Ask them some questions. to come back on November 19th. That is the next meeting here. I know it was crowded in here. We're doing the best we can. Bring your friends, tell your family, bring everybody. I want to mention one other thing. There are some packets out there that are called, and you think they're stress in your life. SSN has dropped these packets off. They're very helpful. Read through them. I know everybody is, is uptight and frustrated and confused and, and you will go through every single emotion there is. Pick up one of these packets and read through it. Talk to your neighbors, your friends, everybody. Call your your senators and your co Congress people. Tell them you want these things right here, that you are concerned for your family, that you want this stopped and cleaned up as fast and quickly as possible. Good night. Be careful. I think the police are out there trying to direct traffic. And Get us on Facebook. Just wants us to yell. Thank you, Paula, for directing everybody in and out and everyone else. Thanks.